The text is same as uh, the reading that we just read, so we will not read it again. I would encourage you, if it is helpful, you may keep Jonah chapter 1 open, so you may follow along throughout the sermon. After the sermon, we will respond by singing hymn 77. Brothers and sisters, pursued by God and his son, the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited to preach to you from the book of Jonah because the book of Jonah is unlike any other book in the Bible. It's quite different from, different from other books of the Bible, so much so that some scholars classify the book of Jonah as a comedy in a technical sense. But do you know what the Jews thought about the book of Jonah? The book of Jonah has a surprisingly prominent place in Judaism, even today. The Jews have been reading the book of Jonah on the holiest day on their calendar, the only day on which the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the Day of Atonement. That's because the main message of the book of Jonah is repentance and God's mercy. So you can tell that it's a really important book. What's interesting is that when the Jews listen to the book of Jonah, when they read the book of Jonah, they identify themselves with Jonah. They say them to themselves, we are Jonah. That really struck me because Jonah is such a terrible prophet. I don't think I'm like Jonah. I doubt that you do. Do you see yourself in Jonah? But maybe we should. That would help. That would be a helpful starting point. Because the book of Jonah shows that God's grace is also for those who are like Jonah. That brings us to the theme and points. The theme of the sermon is God's gracious pursuit of a stubborn prophet. We will consider three points. First, the cause of pursuit. Second, the means of pursuit. Third, the result of pursuit. First, let's focus on the cause of pursuit. The book of Jonah starts with a familiar line in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. That sounds much like the rest of the minor prophets. Then the Lord says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. So far, there's nothing abnormal. But in verse, verse 3, Jonah does something that no other prophet in Israel has ever done. In verse 3, we read, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Why is fleeing to Tarshish linked with fleeing from the presence of the Lord? That's because Tarshish was at the opposite direction of Nineveh. The Jesus story book Bible writes it this way. Jonah went away with his not a very good plan. One ticket to not Nineveh, please, he said and boarded a boat sailing in the very opposite direction of Nineveh. Why is Jonah avoiding Nineveh? We find the answer in the last chapter. Jonah flees from God because he wants Nineveh to be destroyed. If Jonah calls out against Nineveh, he knew somehow that God will spare Nineveh and show mercy. Mercy. 
And why does Jonah want Nineveh to be destroyed? That's because Nineveh was a blooming city of an enemy nation called Assyria. Assyria was a powerful nation. It was about 30 times bigger than the kingdom of Israel. Assyrians conquered people and made them pay tribute and taxes. And they were merciless to those who rebelled against them. And their punishments and torture was gory. And I'd rather not explain how it was the presence of children. Among those who were paying tribute and taxes was Israel. Further, Assyria, if you remember from Bible history, is the nation that destroys the kingdom of Israel and deports all its citizens a century later. So as far as Jonah can tell, Nineveh is an important city of a brutal enemy nation that takes money away from Israel, and a nation that could become a real threat in the near future. And God tells him to preach against it, but he gets a strong sense that he, if he obeys, God will show mercy to Assyria. He, so he flees from, away from the presence of the Lord. You might still wonder, what's the big deal? Allow me to tell you what it's like to have an enemy nearby. To have a hostile nation that threatens your daily life. I come from South Korea, and perhaps you've read that on the bulletin. South Korea is a nation that's situated right next to North Korea. Perhaps you've heard, also heard about North Korea on the news because of its nuclear experiments and missile experiments. Now think about how the South Korean stock market dips when one of those happen. I can tell you that every artillery, artillery in North Korea is aimed towards South Korea to Seoul, its capital city. If there is a war, Seoul will be, in, will be a sea of fire in less than five minutes. And every male, because of that, every male in South Korea is forced to join the armed forces. It's mandatory. And I, too, had to serve in the army for that reason. And if you ask me, I can honestly say that I would be thankful to see North Korea crumble internally. I, I can tell you that there are churches in Korea that praise for this, because that would mean freedom and peace to the people of North Korea and freedom of religion as well. That's how I feel about North Korea. The reason I'm telling you this is that to, to know how Israelites would have felt about the Assyrians, because Israel's situation is much worse than that of South Korea. South Korea doesn't even pay taxes or tribute to North Korea, but Israel was paying tribute and taxes to Assyria. Assyria was a greater threat to Israel than North Korea is to South Korea. Like I said, Assyria does destroy Israel later. They deport all their citizens, the people of Israel. Imagine how it feels to lose a loved one like that, deported as a prisoner of war. So think about how the Israelites would have felt about, about Assyria. That's why Jonah flees, avoids, and disobeys God's command. So I find Jonah totally relatable. And I feel like there's no, we have no business pointing fingers at Jonah. So Jonah flees from Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Is he rejecting God entirely? Though well, the rest of the book doesn't portray Jonah as an unbeliever. 
In fact, we will see later that his faith is quite strong. But right now, he wishes that he could flee flee from God's presence so that he could ignore just one specific command of God. He believes in God, but he compartmentalizes his life in different parts and hides one part and, and holds one part and held one part to himself and did not, didn't submit that part to God. And as I've been saying, for in, in understandable reasons, we might look at Jonah and think, how could he be so stupid? But do you know, do you think that Jonah knew what was coming to him? There are plenty of people who are disobedient in this world, but their lives seem to be fine. In fact, isn't the point of this book God's mercy? Perhaps God will show mercy to Jonah. Perhaps God will send someone else. Now, we don't know exactly what Jonah was thinking, but isn't that how we think and feel sometimes? We think that somehow we can manage our relationship with God when there's a sinful error. Maybe you have an issue that you've thought through and thought to God, I am right and you are wrong. Don't you have times when you drowned the voice of your conscience or when you refuse to listen to the Holy Spirit? Maybe there are times when you wished you could flee from the presence of God, where you wish that God was not present. Maybe there was a time like that, but maybe you've progressed to a point that you don't feel guilty anymore. Remember, Jonah would have felt totally justified. He might have felt justified, But what about the consequences? What this passage shows, brothers and sisters, is that if you have one sinful area in your life, that's enough to distance you from God. Doesn't our experience, our observation confirm that as as well? We don't need five different addictions for our lives to be in total ruins and feel distant from God. We just need one addiction, and that's enough. One persistent sin is enough to take you out. That's all it takes. And that's what happens to Jonah. Because of one single issue that he is not willing to submit to God, he becomes more and more distant from God. He descends further and further away from God. This passage expresses this with a play on words. God is in heaven. But Jonah goes down to Joppa, goes down into the boat, goes down into the inner part of the ship. And in verse, in in the second chapter, he continues to descend. The repetition of going down is intentional, right? And he keeps descending. And we don't know whether there is a limit to that. It's same for us. What do you expect will happen to us when we sin? There is a serious warning in this passage. You can't afford making light of sin. Making light of sin perhaps is a symptom of at least two things. Two things that are incorrect. One is underestimating the power of sin. Scripture makes it very clear that sin is not something that we can control. In fact, Scripture makes it clear that we become enslaved to sin. Sin rules over a person. The second error is taking God's holiness lightly. Lightly. And scripture again makes it very clear that sinners cannot stand in the presence of God. So in our disobedience, all of us will descend more and more away from God. 
and there is no hope in ourselves on our own. But thank, thankfully, in the second part, we will see that God intervenes. He starts to pursue Jonah. See verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. This tempest was so mighty, and it caused so much fear that the sailors hurled their cargo overboard and cried out to their God. But in contrast, look at how stubborn Jonah is and how blind he is. When the captain comes to him, in verse 6, the captain says, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. And how ironic is that here is a captain, an unbeliever, telling Jonah, a prophet of God, to call out to God, that is, to pray. But Jonah just ignores that. He doesn't care about the sailors dying. For Jonah, it's about who has a right on this particular theological issue. That's his only concern and is blind to everything else that's going around him. He's spiritually asleep, hence he's called sleeper. Because of his stubbornness, the storm does not calm down. So in verse 7, the sailors decide to cast lots to find out whose fault it is. And see how blind Jonah has become. You would think that at least Jonah would know that the storm was caused because of him. But then what is he doing waiting for the results of the lots? Maybe he didn't want to admit. So he seems to be huddled around with the rest of the sailors, wondering who the guilty one is. Then when the lot falls on Jonah, that's when it finally, when he admits or sees that the storm is caused because of him. That's what it takes and he gets interrogated in verse 8. Tell us, on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he answers some of these questions and conveniently ignores the question about his occupation. You can see his defense mechanism kicking in. He answers in verse 9, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah knows who God is, and that's alarming. It's alarming considering how disobedient Jonah is. Right? His knowledge of God does not line up, does, does not mean that he is obedient. He even has the mental space to be creative about who God is. He applies who God is in a specific situation. He doesn't use the common title, the maker of heaven and earth. The title Jonah uses applies to his specific situation, maker of sea, of the sea and dry land because he is on the sea. So Jonah isn't lying, nor is he being cheeky. He does fear God, but he just doesn't get it. He is blind to his own hypocrisy. Again, he is asleep. The man says in verse 10, what is this that you have done? You can imagine how that would have sounded like. If you fear the Lord, what do you think you are doing? Fleeing from the presence of the Lord. There's no response from Jonah. There's no calling out to God. 
The most incredible thing that I find in this passage about Jonah is that he does not call out to God. There is no apologies, no woe is me for I am guilty. He's still not giving up his position. He's still standing behind the decision that he made. He still thinks that he is right. And it was already seven verses ago that the storm was so bad that the ship looked like it was going to break. And meanwhile, the storm is getting worse and worse. The man asks in verse 11, what, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? The real answer is that Jonah should repent and all this would be over. Because Jonah has been so stubborn, things have to be done by others to Jonah to fix this problem. And he is the prophet of God. And Jonah's response is still unapologetic. You could almost see Jonah saying, just throw me into the sea. What the pagan sailors do next makes Jonah's stubbornness stand out even more. They try to save Jonah. In verse 13, they rowed hard to get back to dry land. What a vivid picture of sin and its power. The sinner himself is oblivious of his own hypocrisy, of his own sin. And the people around him suffer. The whole ship is going down because of Jonah. And the people around him tries to rescue him. So the sailors row hard to get back to dry land, but they could not now, why couldn't they? The verse continues. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Do you see what's going on here? The Lord who sent the wind, the great wind, is still at work. He's also working through the casting of lots, through the conversation with the sailors. He makes the sea more and more tempestuous. What's going on is that he's still pursuing Jonah, this stubborn little prophet, to the point that it's really difficult to understand why God puts up with Jonah with such insult. Jonah is being defiant to the Lord of the universe. Yet what's humbling is that this book is given to us because we have a tendency to be like Jonah. At this point of the story, do you see yourself in Jonah? Can you say, I am Jonah, that's me? To answer that question, you'll have to ask whether you have given up control in every area of your life? Have you stopped playing God in every area of your life? Let me give you an example to help you with this exercise. There seems to be at least one specific area in my life that I don't allow God's grace to penetrate. I know that we live by grace. Everything is by God's grace. But I realized perhaps that's not how I act. There's a book called The Reset by David Murray. And we were assigned to read this in the seminary. It's a book about burnout. The subtitle of the book is Convicting. The subtitle is Living, Living a Grace-Paced Life in a Burnout Culture. What's convicting about this subtitle is that it was originally written for pastors. And in the introduction, the author asks why so many pastors preach grace, yet live 
as if everything depended on their performance, addressing that hypocrisy in their lives. And that convicted me because I have a bit of perfectionism and I've been working on it. And in all, in all of things, they, they're, they have seen improvements, but there arose a challenge during the seminary, sermon writing and preaching. The burden of handling God's word drives me to performance, knowing that people have to live out that week from the gospel, depending on the gospel that I preached. It feels like everything depends on me, on me being diligent. It feels like everything depends on how correctly I identify the main point of the passage and drawing out the relevant message. Deep down, I should know that God is the one who gives wisdom and strength and insight, but I become fixated with the workload. I jump right into the task and keep applying myself to it. And what am I telling God with my action? Either that he doesn't care about this task or that he is not powerful enough to help me. Instead of calling out to God, Lord, Help me, I cannot do this on my own. I stubbornly try to do things with my own strength. And it doesn't even work. That's when I get overwhelmed and I procrastinate. And thank God it's, it's just been YouTube. But it could have easily been pornography. Right? It's just one click away. I could have easily self-medicated with alcohol or drugs. Like one persistent sin is enough to enslave me. And I find it hard to live out of God's grace given in Christ. And I doubt it's just me or just a few of us. I've, I bet you have a lot on your shoulders. As a spouse, parent, employer, employee, student, and so on. There are people you are responsible for. There are work they are responsible for. You have to get things done, and these things have to get done well. And it's hard to see how everything is by God's grace and not based on our efforts. And grace is just one of many incomprehensible things. There are so many areas we act out of unbelief or even disobedience. There are a million ways to fall and only one way to stand straight. And every time we fail, we're driven away from God. See, we're in the same condition as Jonah separated from God, driven away from God, without hope. But thankfully, we see God's gracious pursuit in this passage. A pursuing God is who he is. From the beginning when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they heard the sound of the Lord looking for them. When they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God calls out, where are you? That's the story of mankind. And that's how things are for you and me. And we have to admit that that's the only reason that we are here today. Do you acknowledge that all of us would be lost if God did not pursue us? In your daily life, do you hear the footsteps of God do you hear the voice of God through the people around you, through the circumstances, and primarily through God's word and sacraments? I asked why God puts up with Jonah. Or perhaps we have to ask the same question about us. 
Scripture says that while we were still sinners, even further, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. God had, had to send his son to pursue us. But Jesus Christ is the shepherd whom God sent to pursue us. He is seeking us out. And when he finds us, he carries us. He is the one who fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Like we, like stubborn sheep, go our own ways, but Christ pursues us and carries us. And how does that make you feel? David expresses this way, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And yet there's even more about God's grace in this passage. As beautiful as we, what we have heard, there's even more. We get to see the result of God's pursuit. In verse 14, the sailors pray to God that they will not be punished because of throwing Jonah into the ocean, into the sea. And says, do not lay on us innocent blood. Not that Jonah was actually innocent, but as, as far as they can see, Jonah hasn't done anything directly to them. So they are feeling really guilty about it. But what about Jonah? Because of Jonah, these sailors had to throw their cargo overboard. If they were merchants, this might be a damage, a financial loss that they will not be able to recover from. But here is Jonah showing no signs of regret despite knowing that it is his fault. Right, right? Even as, as he's being thrown into the sea, he shows no regret, and that is his last chance to apologize to the sailors. I guess he doesn't have the guts to jump, jump into the sea with his own legs, so he lets the sailors pick him, up, pick him up and throw him into the sea. And what's ridiculous, what's appalling, is even at this point, Jonah shows no sign of repentance. He's like a kid in a temper tantrum. What's going on is that he would rather die than admit that he is wrong. It's absolutely unapologetic. And you, you wonder, it makes you wonder what good can come out of from a prophet like this. What's surprising is that even though Jonah is far from being perfect, actually I might I think he might be the worst prophet ever, God only not only pursues him, but he blesses the people around Jonah, through Jonah. So somehow, despite Jonah's attitude, poor attitude, the sailors get to know God. God sets up everything around Jonah. So even though Jonah shows nothing like a gospel-transformed life, nor does he put any effort into witnessing, we see in verse 16 that the sailors come to fear the Lord exceedingly, offer sacrifices and make vows. And clearly, it's not because of Jonah, but because of God. And we can take tremendous comfort in this. I find it comforting that the power of God is not limited to a stubborn and disobedient prophet. If that wasn't the case, I don't know what I'm doing here on a pulpit. Ultimately, God is in control and we can take comfort in that. That shouldn't make us irresponsible 
but we can still take comfort in that, that God can make us into a blessing to people around us. And to what extent? Look at how powerfully God used Jonah. As, as disobedient as he is, he does choose to be thrown into the sea so that the storm would cease. This was a voluntary act that shows that Jonah is intentionally trying to save the sailors. Think about it. Why does it matter if Jonah is thrown into the sea or whether the storm continues to rage and the ship breaks up and he ends up in the sea? Either way, he ends up in the sea. But Jonah chooses to be thrown into the sea. He gives up himself to save the sailors. He sacrifices himself to save others. What you have to catch is that the Lord in his grace shows a glimpse of his glorious son through Jonah. I'm not saying that the sailors knew this or ca catch this and caught this, but we as New Testament, those who have the New Testament should see this Jonah, through Jonah, God shows a glimpse of Jesus Christ. You might wonder whether associating someone as bad as Jonah to Christ is appropriate, but Jesus himself points out the connection between Jonah and himself. In Matthew 12, he says, something greater than Jonah is here, and that's referring to himself. What's amazing is that we get a glimpse of a precious, glorious Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, through Jonah. I mean, look at Jonah. God uses a sinner in the midst of sin as he's fleeing away from God to bring glory to his name. God's grace in Christ prevails over Jonah while Jonah is running away from God. Now, if God can use someone like Jonah to portray Christ, surely he can do the same with us. And what else do you want in life? Think about what this means to you. Is there something better you could wish for your loved ones? Is there anything more important than the eternal destination of your loved ones? Is there anything that makes you feel more powerless than seeing a loved one drifting away from the Lord and there's absolutely nothing you can do? So is there anything better than God's power being displayed through you that others might fear the Lord exceedingly? And this passage makes it very clear who has the power to do that. God is sovereign in his grace. The sovereignty of God's grace comes with a few implications. First, if your loved ones believe and you enjoy their company and you spend time counting your blessings with them, there's a call to humility and praise to God because it's nothing that we have done ultimately. Second, if your loved ones don't believe and you live under crushing guilt because of what you've done, perhaps, there's a call to hope. Because despite our sinfulness, God promised Abraham and his descendants, including us, that we will be a blessing. And God promised to transform us in the image of his son. God promised to use you to be a blessing to your loved ones, just as he used Jonah. Finally, for all of us, there is a call to believe in the promise, in that promise that we can be a blessing, that we will be a blessing to those around us, so that despite our sins, his glory and grace may shine through us. Amen.